Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house and to gather online and we just uh, praise you for your presence in this place. Lord, your word says that when two or three gather, that you are in our midst and we certainly welcome the presence of your Holy Spirit with us today, particularly as we open your word, as you speak to us through that word. So Lord, we, we do open our hearts, we open our minds and our souls to you today that you would lead us somewhere that we need to go today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'm just going to take a little sip of water. Hallelujah. I think everybody loves angel stories, don't we? We love those stories about angels as amazing and somewhat mysterious beings. What are angels after all? I don't know. All I know is they're created beings, but mysterious beings who go here and there doing God's bidding. There's the angel who visited Mary and, and Joseph, the angel who came to, to Gideon and Jacob, all these sort of mysterious appearances, these amazing accounts of these beings who are used for God's glory. Now, you may or may not have noticed that you are not an angel and I am not an angel. Our children are certainly not angels. But today I want to look at an amazing fact. Well, Olivia and Jacob, of course, they're angels. But um, you know, Today I want to look at a, an amazing fact that should excite all of us. That even though we're not angels, even though we don't have that call of God to go there and go there and uh, go here and go there all around the world uh, in that, supernatural way that God has not just got jobs for angels to do God has got an exciting place for every one of us to be used for his glory you don't have to be an angel to be used of God God uses ordinary people like you and me and sadly some Christians have the 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 mistaken belief that God only uses special outstanding people you know so even as a, a, a strong follower of jesus christ we can still fall into that mistaken belief that only if we're really smart or really well resourced or really talented if we're a certain age or even some people think a certain gender that god has not got something for us to do but the good news is, the Bible tells us that God has a plan for each and every one of us. There is no insignificant people. Say, say it with me. I am not an insignificant person. Not one of us. No person on the face of the earth is an insignificant person. We are all important as far as God is is concerned he has a plan he has a purpose he has goals for every one of his children ephesians 2 and verse 10 says this for we are god's workmanship say that with me workmanship workmanship we're god's workmanship created in christ jesus to do not much to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do. Prepared in advance. Showing God has got a plan. He's got a plan for you and for me to do good works. To do things that will make a difference in this world. Do you believe that, Bryce? Amen. It's true, isn't it? It's true. God has got something for us to do. In other words, as, as the title of the message is, Everyone gets to play. You know, when you go to watch the Broncos play, is that what they do? <laughs> if you go to watch the Broncos play around, you've got to stay in the stand. You don't get to play. You can't run down the field and, 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 and run alongside Darius Boyd or anyone like that and, and try and wrestle someone. You get, don't get to do that because you're not a player. But in the kingdom of God, we all get to play. 
Every one of us, we all get to play. Everyone is useful in the kingdom of God. Well, what does that look like? How can you and I be found to be useful in the kingdom of God? And I just want to look at four very quick examples of people who showed us how. But the key point is here, and I, if you've been a spectator in your Christian faith, let today be a shift point where you stop being a spectator and start being a participant. Start playing the game. Get into the game. Start playing. Everyone can play, and that includes you. So move from being a spectator into being someone who embraces the fact that God has got something for you to do. Can you say amen? And maybe as we look at these four examples, you can see yourself in their shoes. You can put yourself in that situation and say, hey, that can be me. I can do that. I can be that person. Firstly, we can be useful in the kingdom of God through what we say. God can use our words. An example I chose was uh, Naaman's servant girl. She doesn't, she's not even given a name. She's not even given a name. We don't know, we don't know her name. All we know is she's Naaman's servant girl. And we read about her in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 2 to 4. <coughs> now bands of Aram, or Syria, had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She was a captive. She was a slave. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. I'm going to dig too deeply into this, but what an amazing girl. She's been taken from her family. She's been made a slave in a foreign country. She's been given jobs to do that she probably doesn't like. And instead of being petulant and fussy and saying, oh, I don't like this situation, the first thing on her mind is, how can I share the glory of my God? What can I do to have an impact in this place that I've been unfairly placed in. Sounds like another person, doesn't sound a bit like Joseph, doesn't it? And when he got imprisoned. But she, her first thought is, oh, uh, now my master has got this serious problem. I think I've got an answer for him in the God of Israel. So even though she was young, even though she was not very important, she was right down in the lowest rung of society, she was actually a slave. This young girl's testimony eventually would bring healing to her master and glory to God in the eyes of a pagan nation. Amazing. Just through what she said. So never underestimate the power of your words to bring God into a situation. Now God can't use all the words we have coming out of our mouth. But never underestimate the power of the right word in a situation. Lives have been turned around because someone has spoken a word into a situation. Many of you sitting here would say, would say yeah, that's me. Someone spoke a word and it changed the direction of my life. It led me into my career or it led me uh, into a... Uh, a relationship, or maybe it led me to find Jesus. Someone spoke a word into your situation. Never underestimate the power of your words to bring God into a situation. He can do it. If we're open, if we're willing, he can use the words that we speak. And that's something that all of us have got. There's no one here who hasn't got words. And if we're Walking with God, he can use our words in the right way to bring him glory. So God can use my words. Secondly, we can be useful in the kingdom of God through what we do. God can use my abilities. Now, we took a good look at this guy a, a few weeks ago, and uh, I'm going to put him up again as a great example of our point, and that is the young man David. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 33 to 37 says this, Saul replied, You are not able to go up against this Philistine and fight him, 
you are only a boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I si- seized or sized, seized it by its hair, struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the enemies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So despite his youth, despite the discouragement of his brothers who were there with him, David decides to take action. He decides he can do something. If we're open, God will give you and me opportunities where we can take action. It's an opportunity that's given to us. It's not given to someone else. You know, we shouldn't always be looking to the other guy, the other person, to take action. Sometimes God wants us to be the one to take action. He wants us to be the doer in this situation. We need to remember that there's always a doing element to the life of faith. It's not all about praying, as important that is. It's not all about our words. We've already said our words are very important. But there's a doing element to our faith. There's an action element to our faith. We saw there used to be a ministry in Haiti called Hands and Feet of Jesus. Hands and Feet of Jesus. It was a doing ministry towards uh, impoverished children be great to pray for those children great to come in and bring a testimony to those children but their ministry was to feed and clothe and house and be hands on helping those kids have a better life hands and feet of Jesus sometimes there is something for us to do God has got something for us to do and if God gives us something to do just like with David the odds then become irrelevant because God is with us in it God is with us in it. So what we do is important. Thirdly, we can be useful in the kingdom of God by what we give. God can use the gifts that we bring. A great example with a a young boy with five loaves and two fishes. We read about him in John chapter 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus asks a question he already knows the answer to. He asks this only to test him, for he he already had in mind what he was going to do. Phyllis answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, probably almost humorously I said, there's a boy here with um, five barley loaves and two fish. (laughs) What about that? Jesus says, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them, along with their women and their children, say maybe 10,000 maybe 15,000. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted and he did the same with the fish. When, all, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces of left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten them. So as that young boy offered to the Lord what he had, even though it was not much, if anything, in the eyes of men, God was able to do a mighty miracle. And sort of amazing, really, one boy's generous gift, we talk about it 2,000 years later. You know, he, did, he brings this 
relatively or seemingly insignificant gift to God and uh, we're still talking about it. So I guess the question is on that, what has God given us that we in turn give on to be used in his service? And we've been doing that. We've all been doing that in various ways. Our tithes and offerings are an expression of that. Our gifts to the ministry in Thailand are an example of that. And so many of you are compassion uh, parents, compassion donors, um, World Vision donors, Operation Christmas Child donors. That giving has the, has the outcome of people being blessed in Jesus' name and things changing. It may not be the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, but the truth is you don't know what the outcome will be. You don't know what the outcome will be. And it can be of that magnitude if God chooses it to make it that way. You know, sometimes our giving is small, but then another person sees our giving, a person of far greater resources, and they are prompted to give greatly. So your small gift becomes a great gift because of the influence of that gift. I'm sure that's happened many, many, many times as we brought our offering to the Lord. So the gifts we bring are used useful in the kingdom of God. And finally, number four, we can be useful in the kingdom of God through our prayers. We all know that God can certainly use our prayers in a meaningful way. The example I have here is the church praying for Peter. Another amazing miracle, this time wrought through, not through giving, but through prayer. Now it's in Acts chapter 12 and from verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gates leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they'd walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. Now, Peter's friends were desperate. There wasn't anything they could physically do to help Peter. They couldn't storm the prison and, and overcome the guards and break him out that way. They couldn't fling a thing of dynamite in there and blow up the prison like, you know, on some action movie. They couldn't do that. But what they could do was pray. And in the end, prayer was all that was needed in that situation because God sent one of those amazing angels that we spoke of earlier to release Peter. And of course, prayer is something open to all of us, whether we're a, a kid at school or whether we're an adult or whether we're an older person we've all got access to prayer, to communication with God. So we all get to play. And I hope that we can really see that, that regardless of our age, regardless of our experience, regardless of our resources or our ability or even what we feel as limited opportunities, regardless of all those things, there are many, many ways that you and I can be effective for the kingdom of God. We can use our voice, we can use our actions, our gifts and our prayers 
to see God move in our life and in the life of others. Of course, in all of these things, faith is so very important. We need to trust God that whatever he wants to do as a result of our words, as a result of our actions or our gifts or our prayers, we have to be willing to trust God with the outcome of a thing. See, God just simply calls us to do, to take action in one of those areas. What God does not give us is the ability to call the result. And praise God for that. Imagine if you and I were in control of results. We think it would be good. We think it would be good. But no, it probably wouldn't be so good. I'm happy to trust God with the outcome of things, aren't you? But what God does want us to do is to speak, to act, to give, to pray, as he calls us to do. He wants us to do that. In all these things, beyond anything we do, in the kingdom of God, there is one thing that God values above it all, and that is our relationship with him. When Jesus came into the world, he made it possible for every man, woman, boy and girl to come into relationship with him. He came, led a sinless life, those wonderful teachings, those wonderful miracles, his death on the cross that paid the price for us, all of that done so that you and I can become children of God. We can become the sons and daughters of God. And as sons and daughters of God, what is the best thing that any child can do for their parents? Well, obedience and spending time with them, right? To spend time with our Heavenly Father. So God wants us to do that as well. Through prayer and reading his word, just meditating, reflecting with him, spending time with him. Because it's out of those times that we not only grow closer to God, but we're also more open. We're also more hearing and more ready and willing and able to be effective in the kingdom of God. So you can see our relationship with God dovetails with everything else that I've said this morning. As we spend time with him, we, we learn, we discern what I'm going to say, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to give, how I'm going to pray. We, our, our understanding of what to do in those situations comes out of that relationship with Jesus. Every one of us, every one of us here can shine their light for Jesus in the world. And that's exactly what he calls us to do. As I said, there's no spectators in the kingdom of God. Nobody's been saved to sit and watch. Not one of us. No one's been saved to sit and watch. We've all been saved to be in the game, to play, to participate in the kingdom of God. Everyone gets to play. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for every person in this place, every person listening online. Lord, I thank you for the realized potential of every one of us and the unrealized potential of every one of us. Lord, we thank you for what you've led us to do in times past. We thank you for the ways that we've been used for the kingdom of God in times past. But Lord, we also look ahead with expectation to what you're going to do through each one of our lives. For Lord, the, the, the book has not yet been written. The page, the final page has not been yet marked. Lord, you're still writing on the book of our life. You are still scribing in the book of our life our impact for the kingdom of God. And Lord, we don't want to be missing it out. We don't want to, we don't want to miss your calling. We don't want, don't want to miss how you want to use us for the extension 
of your kingdom. Lord, I pray we would receive a fresh openness today. Lord, I pray if we've been just apathetic about pushing into our relationship with you, about knowing you more closely, about spending time in your word, about spending time in prayer and meditation. Lord, I pray that you give us a quiet rebuke in our spirit, even right now, and encourage us and challenge us and lead us that we'd have a deepened desire to do exactly that. So that flowing out from that, we can discern what it is that you have for us to do. Lord, take our minds off what we think someone else should do. Lord, take that far from our minds, what we think others should do. And Lord, let our focus be on what you have called us to do. For Lord, that is where there is power and that is where there is effectiveness. That is where there is satisfaction and joy for our lives. So Lord, help us to know these things. Draw us close to yourself by your Holy Spirit. We pray that as we go out into this week, we would go out in your power, in your anointing, with your discernment, and every one of us would find the joy of being used by you for your glory in this coming week. And we would give you glory and praise in that as we see it take place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Make sure everyone feels really welcome.